don't look at our next big speaker, who's actually even bigger than any other speaker. He's about 10 feet. Don't look at him yet. Because uh, I'm honored that uh, my friend Dr. Timothy Boone, class of 1977, is with us today, and he will introduce our next speaker. Dr. Boone chairs the urology department and is the co-director of the Institute for Academic Medicine at Houston Methodist Hospital. He also holds faculty appointments at Weill Cornell Medical College, Texas A&M College of Medicine, Baylor College of Medicine, and is the primary investigator for the Neuroregeneration and Bladder Sensory Science Laboratory at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. A lifelong learner, Dr. Boone earned his Bachelor of Science degree in biology right here at Southwestern, and then went on to earn his PhD in neuroscience at the University of Texas Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at Houston, and completed his medical degree at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. Throughout his career, Dr. Boone has written over 100 publications and has given hundreds of lectures around the world. He serves as a consultant uh, reviewer for several scientific journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Boone was elected to the American Board of Urology in 2006 and served as its president from 2011 to 2012. We are proud and privileged that he chairs the Southwestern Science Center Advisory Council and grateful to have him among our generous supporters to this incredibly important facilities project on our campus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Boone. My pleasure. Good afternoon. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tim. <laughs> it's, it's really a distinct honor and privilege to return to my alma mater here at Southwestern to introduce a longtime friend and colleague in urology. Anthony Atala is the director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and he's the W.H. Boyce Professor and Chair of Urology at Wake Forest University. Dr. Atala's achievements are already legendary in our field of urology. As a practicing surgeon and researcher, Tony embraced tissue engineering in the human when regenerative medicine was truly in its infancy. His leadership in this field of regenerative medicine is exemplified by his editorial appointments in over a dozen leading journals including Editor-in-Chief of Stem Cell Translational Medicine, Current Stem Cell Research and Therapy, and Therapeutic Advances in Urology. Dr. Atala is the recipient of many awards, including the U.S. Congress Christopher Columbus Foundation Award, which is bestowed to a living American who is working on a discovery that will significantly affect society. And the Raymond Gutierrez Award, from our American Urological Association for his pioneering and outstanding contributions as both a scholar and a teacher. In 2011, Tony was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. This is a very prestigious honor for any practicing physician. And in 2013, he received the Edison Science Medical Award. Dr. Atala heads a team of over 300 physicians and researchers at the Wake Forest Institute, where for over 10 years, regenerative medicine applications have been developed and used clinically. One decade ago, Dr. Atala and his team bioengineered urethral tissue for five boys using their own cells to help reconstruct damaged and dysfunctional tissue. This was followed by early trials to replace diseased bladder tissue in children born with spina bifida and the sequelae of having abnormal nerves innervating their bladder. This is a specialty in urology that's very dear to my heart as well. Bladder biopsy tissue was taken from these children, harvested, the cells were separated by type, they were then expanded to create or regenerate more tissue to increase the capacity of the bladders in these children when the scaffolds were ready and housed the cells that were ready to be implanted back in the children. This is a bold step in clinical translation for regenerative medicine. 
This work led to the Scientific American's Award as Medical Treatments Leader of the Year in 2003 and Discover Magazine's number one top science story of the year in 2007. Tony's passion and leadership in the field of regenerative medicine is translated to positions of service at the National Institutes of Health in Cell and Developmental Biology, the NIH Bioengineering Consortium, and the National Cancer Institute Advisory Board. I could go on and on about Tony, but he's here today to talk to you and you want to hear Tony's story, not mine, about applications of regenerative medicine to 3D printing. We welcome Tony. Wish you were here. Tim, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be able to share this time with you and I wish we could do so in person. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank the audience for uh, being here uh, at this wonderful symposium, which is so uh, amazing. I wish I could have been there in person. As you know, we had a big snow here in North Carolina, and that really paralyzes things at our end. So my flight was canceled, and I, I'm sorry I cannot be there in person, but I guess this is the best thing I get to see all of you through this camera, which is probably better than if I were there in person. So it's... Uh, uh, so it's really nice to see all of you. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to you, uh, to uh, the, the university, the president, and the whole organizing team at the symposium. Uh, I'm, I, I hope you see the slides now on the screen. Terrific. Thank you. So basically, um, what I thought I would do today is really give you an overview of this field that we call uh, regenerative medicine and to try to give you some idea in terms of how we approach this field, some of the basic principles of the field, and how we're applying this to treat patients now and in the future. First, a little bit about the past. This is actually a painting that hangs at the Conway Library at Harvard Medical School, and it shows the very first time an organ was ever transplanted. In the back room, you see Hartwell Harrison, who was the chief of urology, getting the patient ready for the transplant. and the front, you see Joe Mary, who was getting the patient uh, actually ready to transplant the organ, and the first organ was actually a kidney. And this was back in 1954, and this was a successful operation, and so many lives that have been saved by this one single accomplishment. But the fact is that it's not a perfect solution. Every 30 seconds, a patient dies from diseases that could be treated with tissue replacement. And this is really due mostly to the fact that organ rejection can still occur with transplantation and organs can still fail. But more important, we have a major shortage of donor organs. And wouldn't it be great if we could basically just uh, regenerate ourselves? Wouldn't that be great? Well, is that science fiction? Not really. Actually, one of the things that happen in nature is that things can, in fact, regenerate. This is the uh, limb of a salamander, and you, this is real time-lapse photography. And you can see here the salamander limb fully regenerating after it was injured within seven days. So the question, of course, is if a salamander can do it, why can't we? And that's really where this field comes in that we call regenerative medicine. But in reality, this field that we call regenerative medicine is not a new field. It really dates back to the early 1930s when the first concept of actually regenerated organs first came up. And this is a textbook that was published back in 1938 titled The Culture of Organs. And you can recognize here one of the authors. This is Alexis Carell. He was a Nobel Prize winner, like Joe Mary, who got a Nobel Prize for the first uh, organ transplant. Alexis Carrel was actually a French surgeon who worked in Lyon, France, and he basically designed the very same techniques that we still use today for vascular surgery. And he implanted the very first grafts for vascular surgery. And you can see here the co-author is Charles Lindbergh. That is the same Charles Lindbergh who flew across the Atlantic back in the 1930s. He actually spent the rest of his life working with Alexis Carell at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, where Alexis had moved. 
So this field has been around for a long time. And now if we look today, 2015, at the field of regenerative medicine, we can really look at very various options that we have to regenerate tissues and organs. We can use scaffolds alone, that is materials that to the naked eye look like a piece of your shirt or your blouse, but basically they're materials designed to go inside the body and enhance regeneration. We can use cells alone. We can use cells and scaffolds together, and we can use other strategies as well. We're gonna cover these briefly. First, using scaffolds alone. Again, we have a very large family of materials that we use. These are the same materials that we use in surgery. For example, the meshes that we use for hernia repair. These materials are mostly degradable. Basically, they're designed so that once inside the body, the materials go away on their own over a defined period of time. So most of these materials, basically once inside the body, resorb within three months, just like sutures that you have during surgery. So we can take different kinds of materials and basically take advantage of their properties to allow us to regenerate the human body or, or organs or tissues of the human body using these materials alone. This is actually uh, a electrospinning machine that you see here. And basically, uh, this is uh, like a cotton candy machine. And you can see out of this needle nozzle, instead of having sugar making cotton candy, for example, you're having these fibers coming out, making a scaffold. And these scaffolds are fully degradable. Again, they're made with similar materials as we used in surgery. And we can make them in different sizes and shapes in the laboratory. And again, they're fully degradable, fully reabsorbable. And we can then use these scaffolds to regenerate tissue. For example, here's a patient who presented in the mid-1990s with an injured organ. And you can clearly see here the area of the injury. This part of the organ is normal, this part is normal, but here you see this whole injured area. And what you also notice from this patient is that the bottom portion is normal tissue, it's a top portion that's injured. So we basically use these materials to help regenerate the organ. We basically took away the injured tissue and we then replace the injured tissue with this material that we made in the laboratory. And by doing so, we replace the top half of the tunnel, if you will. And by doing so, we replace the entire segment of that injured area. And by replacing the area, we observe this rule that we discovered in the early 1990s that the maximum distance for tissue regeneration was half a centimeter from any edge. That is, you have normal tissue here, and what's going to happen is that the cells from the normal tissue are going to walk on that bridge that we just put in. And the cells from both sides, the normal cells will walk on that bridge and bridge the gap. But the maximum distance by which this can occur in the human body is about only half a centimeter from any edge. And basically the distance between here and here and here and here is about half a centimeter from any edge. So by using these strategies, these materials then go away and the cells that walk on the bridge lay down their own material to regenerate the tissue and the organ. And that's exactly what you see here. Basically, this was the injured organ prior to surgery. And this is a fully regenerate, regenerated organ six months after surgery. And what happened here is that the cells from the normal tissue walked on that bridge regenerated a new tissue, and then that bridge that we put in went away on its own, leaving only the patient's tissue behind. And we were able to show that in this in 1996, that these structures really could be engineered and could be regenerated using the scaffolds alone, just the scaffolds, just the materials, without any cells, taking advantage of the body's own ability to regenerate. We can also use cells alone. Basically, this is a strategy to replace uh, burns, uh, uh, burned skin. And when we have an injury with a burn, you can have either first degree, second degree, or the most severe third degree burns. And these can be fairly devastating. They can scar and they can disfigure people in terms of their injury. And what we see here is that basically this is a kit. Uh, basically, a, a small piece of skin is taken from a patient. 
the piece of skin is placed on the skin. Cells are then scraped off the piece of uh, tissue from the normal uh, skin of a patient. And this is a technology that was uh, uh, developed by Fiona Wood and Dr. Fiona Wood. And basically the cells are then placed in a spray gun and the cells are sprayed over the burn area. And we now have uh, clinical trials ongoing here that we're leading here in the U.S., 10 centers in the U.S. led out of Wake Forest using this strategy to regenerate skin in patients with burns. We also have, uh, we also have the use of cells and scaffolds together. And basically, we can use this for larger defects, any defect that is larger than half a centimeter from any edge. The concept here is that if you do have a patient who has an injury, we take a very small piece of tissue from the patient, less than half the size of a postage stamp. We then take that little piece of tissue and we scrape the cells away. We then are able to expand the cells outside the body. We're able to lay the cells on one of these uh, resorbable materials, like a mesh, if you will, and we then are able to implant that material back into the patient. And that's a strategy. Basically, you take a small biopsy from the tissue, you take the cells from the biopsy, you grow and expand the cells, and then you place the cells back on a large piece of material, and it's very much like baking a layer cake, if you will. We're doing this one layer at a time. And then we did this with muscle, <clears throat> and this is basically muscle strips that we regenerated using this strategy. And this is a muscle bioreactor. It's basically like an exercise machine. And you can see here the exercise machine uh, pulling and pushing these muscle strips, basically exercising the muscle so that these muscle strips can then be implanted uh, uh, inside the body. And again, the muscle cells are, uh, were obtained from the patient through a small piece of tissue. We have also done this uh, 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 for patients. And basically what you see here is that we had patients who had a urethral injury. This is something that Tim Boone mentioned a few minutes ago. These are patients who have an injured urethra. That's a channel that connects the bladder to the outside uh, portion of the body. And the concept here is that we bring the patient six to eight weeks prior to the scheduled surgery. We take a very small piece of tissue through a minimally invasive approach, just a very small piece, less than half the size of a postage stamp of that specific uh, uh, organ from the normal side, we then expand the normal cells outside the body in large quantities in culture. We then take a piece of the mesh, these biodegradable meshes that we use, these materials, we tubularize the material and we then place one cell type, the muscle cells on the outside, very much like baking a layer cake, one layer at a time. We place those muscle cells on the outside of this tubular scaffold we place the epithelial cells, or the cells that line the urethra, this organ, inside, very much like, again, baking a layer cake. And once we have layered all the cells, we place this construct in a bioreactor that has the same conditions as a human body. It's an oven-like device that has the same temperature, same oxygen concentration as a human body. It's like an oven-like device, if you will. And we then are able to take this construct and put it right back where the injury was present. And basically that's what you see here. This is an x-ray of this patient showing you that from here to here, the organ was entirely injured. You can see here as this is a bladder and this is contrast or a radio opaque material, a material you can see through an x-ray that basically you can see the material start, uh, gets to the tip of the bladder, but then it starts dissipating outside the bladder and this whole organ is missing from here to here. And what we did here is we took a small biopsy from that patient from the normal tissue. We expanded the cells as we described. We then tubularized the scaffold, these meshes that are resorbable. We then placed the muscle cells on the outside, placed the lining cells on the inside. We placed it in a bioreactor that allows the cells to mature in the same conditions as a hu human body in an oven-like device. And this shows a construct now fully seated with the cells. And we then are able to place that construct back into the patient surgically. And you can see here the patient's x-ray before 
uh, the organ was engineered and the patient's x-ray after the organ was engineered showing that these urethras did well over time and that these patients had normal function uh, when we published the paper. We published the paper in the, journal, the medical journal The Lancet in 2011. When we published the paper, we had over a 60-year follow-up on our patient series, uh, on the series of patients that we had treated. We have also used these strategies to engineer other organs like blood vessels. Same strategy here. Instead of using uh, urethral cells, muscle cells on the outside, we use blood vessel muscle cells on the outside. Instead of using urethral lining cells, we use blood vessel lining cells on the inside, and we create these tubular structures, these blood vessels, and we put them in these bioreactors that you see here. And these bioreactors basically exercise the blood vessels. You're seeing here the bioreactor. You can see the blood vessel structure that is being engineered inside these bioreactors pulsating. You can see the blood vessel pulsating. We're seeing it pulsating a little bit slower because of the video feed, but usually these pulsate uh, using the same number of beats as a human blood vessel would uh, beat, so about 80 beats per minute. And this is a carotid artery. This is that was implanted experimentally. That is a blood vessel that grows from your neck, from your neck uh, to your brain, uh, right here. And this was uh, implanted experimentally and uh, highlighted in this journal, Nature Medicine. We have also uh, engineered more complex tubular structures such as heart valves. This is an engineered heart valve that you see here. Same strategy from the bioreactor. You're seeing the heart valve inside the bioreactor and the bioreactor is basically exercising the heart valve so the heart valve knows what to do before it gets implanted. You can see here the heart valve leaflets opening and closing as these bioreactors are exercising the structure. Now we have not implanted these structures in patients yet at this point. This is still uh, going through preclinical testing. We've talked about flat structures such as skin. They're by far the least complex. Uh, they're mostly uh, flat structures. They are mostly made up of one cell type. They're not as complex as tubular structures like blood vessels uh, or urethras. These are uh, structures which are, which are tubular in the shape of a tube. They have two major cell types instead of one. Architecturally, it's uh, more complex than a flat structure. The third level of complexity are hollow, non-tubular organs, like the stomach or the bladder. These organs have a much more complex architecture. The, the shape is more complex. The cells are functionally more complex. And there's usually more interaction with other organs. So this is an example of a hollow non-tubular structure. Basically, same strategy for the patient as we demonstrated before. We bring the patients in six to eight weeks prior to their scheduled surgery. We take a very small piece of the tissue from the bladder. We grow and expand the cells outside the body. We then, once we expand the cells, we take a construct in the shape of a bladder. We coat the outside with muscle cells the inside with the bladder lining cells. We then place that in the bioreactor. We place that structure then uh, to, for it to mature, and we're able to put that right back into the patient, as you see here. And we published a preclinical work in this journal, Nature Biotechnology, back in the late 1990s. And this allowed us to go into our phase one clinical trials. And these were patients that were uh, born with a, a congenital abnormality of their bladders. And basically, uh, you can see here the three-dimensional structure of these organs before and after uh, they were implanted. And we were able to publish this work in the, in the journal The Lancet in 2006. And these patients from this phase one series, uh, we had three uh, series of patients until we perfected the technology. And these patients are still uh, walking around with their engineered organs and doing well with their engineered organs. Phase two clinical trials were conducted with this technology, and in fact, Dr. Tim Boone is one of the star urologists in the nation who also participated in these clinical trials. And basically, these trials uh, showed that the technology, you really do need to allow the bladders to cycle and uh, the technology to be perfected. So we are actually going now to phase three clinical trials that we are initiating uh, over the next uh, year 
uh, with this technology to treat more patients. We have also, uh, so we've uh, talked about flat structures such as skin, tubular structures such as blood vessels and urethras, hollow non-tubular organs. By far the most complex are solid structures. And what you see here is basically uh, one of the simple solid structures like an ear. And this is how we used to make these ears. Basically we create the mold and we then over the mold we place these cells. We basically use existing molds we then use cartilage cells on top of these structures. We then place these structures in the oven-like device and allow the cells to mature. This shows the oven-like device, the incubator that has the same conditions as a human body. And once inside that structure, about six weeks later, uh, from the time we took the biopsy from the patient, the small piece of tissue from the patient, we can then implant these into, uh, back, uh, ex into experimental models. This is showing you how we're creating digits or fingers. So we're using bone to seat in these areas here. We're using cartilage that we're gonna place in these middle areas here. And then we use the muscle strips that we showed you earlier from one end to the other end of the digit. And this is uh, work that is still being done experimentally, uh, not yet in humans. Another strategy that we started using in the early 1990s, about 20 years ago, when we started uh, working on these solid organs, we realized that we really had a challenge. We could create the flat structures, we could create the tubular structures, we could create the hollow non-tubular structures, but we were having major difficulties creating solid organs. And the limitation we had was that the scaffolds, the materials that we were using, did not have the right three-dimensional architecture. So about 25 years ago, we had a, a, an idea, we had a concept. What if we take donor organs uh, that are discarded, discard organs that are not being used, and we then can use very mild detergents to wash the cells away, and then we're left with a three-dimensional architecture of an organ that we can then repopulate with a patient's own cells. And that's exactly what you see here. Let's say you have a liver that is not going to be used for a donor, for a recipient. And the, the liver is now going to be discarded. Instead of discarding the liver, we take the liver, we use very mild detergents to wash the cells away. Two weeks later, we're left with something that looks like a liver. You can hold it like a liver, but it has no cells. However, we are able to preserve the blood vessel tree. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a basically an experimental liver. You can see that we have washed the cells away, but we are able to preserve the uh, architecture of the liver, not only externally, but also internally with this blood vessel tree. So we then are able to perfuse this uh, uh, blood vessel tree with the patient's own cells. We can then infiltrate the body of this uh, mold, if you will, with liver cells to create three-dimensional liver organoids uh, that you see here that we've been able to create these miniature three-dimensional liver organoids that are able to secrete uh, the kinds of proteins uh, and solutes and waste products that the liver secretes and absorbs. So we, this is still now only creating small structures about the size of half a dollar uh, to the size of a lemon, a small lemon. So the challenge for us is how do we create these structures and keep making them larger and larger so someday we can plant, implant these into patients. Another strategy that we have used to engineer uh, organs uh, is bioprinting and we started doing this about 11, 12 years ago now. Uh, it's going to be 12 years now in just a few months but we basically started thinking of a way to really scale up the technology. Up to this point, we were creating these tissues and organs one at a time by hand. We were engineering them one at a time. And the concept was, how can we scale this up? How can we actually make this in a way that we can recreate the same structure over and over again? So about 12 years ago, we started looking at bioprinting as a possible option. So we looked at just our, your typical desktop inkjet printer, the one that you can use at home and we started looking at how can we modify these printers to actually bioprint tissues. So we took an inkjet cartridge, just your typical inkjet cartridge that you have in your, uh, in your desktop printer, an inkjet printer, and we then clean and sterilize those, car those cartridges. And instead of using uh, ink, we use cells uh, with a hydrogel. 
and we then basically modified the printers with a 3D elevator so that every time the printhead would go through, uh, it would uh, print one layer of cells. So here we see the printhead. We just placed the uh, cells in the hydrogel in the printhead. We're going to cover the, the uh, printhead, place it in the printer. We modified the printer so it would have a 3D elevator. Every time the printhead would go through, it would add an extra layer of hydrogel and cells onto the tissue, as you see here. This is, again, just uh, your typical uh, home uh, desktop inkjet printer, but modified to do this. And about uh, uh, 40 minutes later, you see this two-dimension, this three-dimensional hard structure uh, that we were able to print. And about four to six hours later, you can see the whole structure uh, beating. And under the microscope, you can see the cardiomyocytes, the heart cells beating, and they are beating in unison. Again, you're seeing them beat slowly because of the video feed, but these are actually beating at pretty much the same pace as you would see them uh, in a normal heart. Um, so this is a technology that we started developing, but we discovered very early on that this technology would not be very helpful to implant these structures. We were able to show that, yes, indeed, we can print these structures, but they didn't have the right mechanical strength or handling properties that we would need for long-term survival of these organs. So we then started designing uh, much more sophisticated printers that would actually allow us to generate 3D freeform shape constructs that would have high strength and would allow for the precise placement of multiple cell types and proteins. And these are some of the printers that we use now. These are all built in-house here at our institute. Uh, and we've been developing these printers now for, uh, for the last 12 years to uh, have them now be fairly sophisticated printers. The working principle that we use for our printers is basically using a scaffolding technique where, which allows us to maintain the structural integrity of the tissue. So here what you see is you're seeing uh, the blue and the yellow being printed and just picture one color being our scaffold design and the other one being our cells. And that we have this scaffolding matrix technique that allows us to support the printing of these cells over and over again, layer after layer uh, that you see here. And this is actually the actual print head going through and uh, printing the structures. And you can see very precise placement of these cells with these printers uh, using uh, sophisticated hydrogels. And for example, we uh, are able to do this for bony defects where we can print bone. Uh, we basically take the image from an x-ray and we can then place different cell types to create these uh, bone structures that you see here. This is, actually a, uh, uh, this is actually a printed hip bone that was implanted experimentally. You can see here the, the hip bone that was implanted surgically uh, using these techniques. Uh, and then we have also used this to print uh, much more sophisticated structures, such as liver structures, uh, where we allow us for very precise uh, placement of the cells. So the a very precise placement of either liver uh, structures with over five different cell types for the, uh, for the liver, uh, muscle uh, and epithelial uh, cell uh, lining structures here. For the cardiac muscle, for example, you can see the different colors here down below where we have color coded the cells just to make them uh, more visible. Uh, testicular tissue, kidney structures, so a lot of different tissues and organs whether they be very large solid organs like the liver or very strong muscle tissue like the heart. The printing, what the printing does is allows us for precision and uh, scalability. And the way that we uh, use the approach is we basically reverse engineer by using medical imaging. For example, we use just images of x-rays that we commonly use in the, in, in, in the clinic, like from CT scans or MRIs. These are types of x-rays that we use in the clinic. And we then use 3D CAT software that allows us to basically uh, do a tool path generation and a program, uh, motion program generation that allows us then to print everything layer by layer. And here's a CT scan of a, uh, of a, um, of a face. And we basically are able then to create the structure of the nose, for example, with a 3D CAT model. We can then visualize the motion program. We can print this nose structure as you see here. And we are using these, uh, uh, these techniques here where basically 
um, we are using commonly available software programs. This is a program that's available in basically every major hospital around the country or similar programs. This particular program is called Terra Recon, commercially available, easy, easily available, but we take an x-ray from a patient and then with 3D rendition, this is a 3D rendition of a patient's x-ray and here we see the kidney structures from that patient and let's say that we want to make a new kidney for that patient. We then take that information from this x-ray and we take the three-dimensional information from the x-ray and we then are able to transfer that information through the cat printing software through imaging where basically we're able to transfer that digital information to our printer to recreate this three-dimensional structure that we then are able to print layer by layer as you see here and we use this sacrificial polymer on the outside to hold the hydrogel in place once the whole construct is printed we use hot water to dissolve the outer shell that you see here leaving the structure behind and these are for example miniature kidneys that we have engineered uh, using uh, uh, a, 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 a different technique but just to show you the concept that these miniature kidneys can in fact be engineered and they can be implanted experimentally where they secrete yellow fluid which is consistent uh, with dilute urine and basically showing functionality of these uh, uh, organs over time. So basically then with this 3D printing technology what we're able to do is we're able to take all the knowledge that we gained before by engineering tissues and organs we can now transfer this technology to these printers that allow us to have scalability precision and more important reproducibility where we know that we can print these organs in the same manner every time. And basically, uh, we are now also designing uh, uh, more sophisticated printers. This is actually a printer that we can use to print right on the patient. For example, let's say that the patient presents with an injury on their, uh, on their uh, skin and outer uh, surface of the body. We basically place a patient uh, uh, on a, uh, on a uh, machine. Uh, we, go, we can go to the bedside and then place a machine over the patient and then we can scan the patient's injury as you see here and then the scanner goes back and it prints right over the patient where you need where you where you where you actually need uh, the tissue and the, the tissue that needs to be in the correct location so this printer these printers have basically a portable frame you have the patient bed underneath you have the print heads above and it has infrared sensors with a camera and the cell cartridges that you can use to print right on the patient. This is a pictorial here uh, of how it, the technology actually works. You can see the scanner here going through scanning the area and then you can see the actual printing uh, of the layers uh, one at a time. And this technology is basically currently uh, being developed where it can actually, um, uh, this technology is being developed where you can actually use now the more sophisticated printing strategies and, uh, and printing machines uh, that, that can be used for patients and that's actually be heading to uh, for clinical utility in, in terms of its preparation. So what I've tried to do for you right now is really give you an overview of where we are with these technologies that we, uh, and how we're using uh, the, the field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine to really engineer many of these different types of tissues. And uh, at, at our institute here at Wake Forest, we are basically working on over 30 different types of tissues and organs. About 20% of these have already entered uh, the clinical trials and patients. We're working now on developing a, a large number of other tissues and organs that we can transfer to patients. And the major thing for us is to really take what we have done by hand and to really automate it with about printing technology. And we've been working hard over the last 12 years to, to make that happen. This is actually a technology that we are using also for uh, printing what we call a uh, body in a chip. And this is a uh, body in a chip, a chip Excel program that's being funded by the Department of Defense for us to look at uh, uh, chemical and biological warfare. But what we do here is we, we are printing miniature organoids uh, and using uh, these organoids uh, on microchips with biosensing capacity. So we're borrowing from the computer industry in terms of the microchips 
and we're borrowing from the uh, life sciences area in terms of di the diagnostics area in terms of biosensing to combine bioprinting, computer technology, and diagnostics together to create what we call body in a chip where we can bioprint these miniature uh, organoids that we can then place on these microchips and we can do drug testing uh, so that we can have a higher hit in terms of success for potential drugs. It's interesting to note that currently over 90% of drugs that get developed and enter phase one clinical trials in humans actually fail, over 90%. And the reason for that is that drugs, the way that pharmaceutical companies screen drugs, you're screening major libraries of drugs, and once the drugs are screened, they use cell lines to test the drugs, and cell lines are not really normal human cells. They're basically cell lines which have been modified, or they're using animal models, small animal models like mice uh, or rats, and uh, you know, mice and rats, rodents are not human. So you go through this whole screening process and this major cost to screen drugs, and you finally get them into patients for a phase one clinical trial, but when you get them to a phase one clinical trial, 90% of them fail. So the question is, can we come up with better systems where we can test drugs, potential drugs, before they get to the patient for higher success, and therefore this system is being designed just for that purpose, where we can actually now print miniature uh, organoids like the heart or the liver, and these are highly functional. Uh, they're made with human cells, they're bioprinted, so they have the same type of, uh, of functionality as, uh, uh, or, or a very similar functionality as that of a normal organ. For example, if we look at, at uh, the liver, if we're actually looking at the liver, we can actually uh, have miniature organoid livers that are able to secrete the proteins that liver secrete uh, and metabolize the drugs that, liver, that the liver metabolizes, and it basically replicates what a normal human liver would do in terms of metabolizing drugs. So this is a new program called Body on a Chip. So what I've tried to do for you, uh, and this is actually a, um, uh, that's the slide I was looking for right there. This is actually um, the, uh, a, a liver, a human liver that you see here. And this is a human liver, and you can see all the shapes of the liver. And you can see here how we're able to reproduce that with our uh, bioprinted liver organoid. Uh, and basically, this actually is able to secrete the things that liver secretes and metabolize the things that livers metabolize. So what I've tried to do for you today really is give you an overview of where we are in the field of regenerative medicine. We basically can use materials alone. Again, these are materials that are designed to degrade once inside the body. And we can use these materials alone for small distances, small defects that are less than half a centimeter from any edge. And if we use these materials for that size defect, we can do that just by using the material alone without any cells. And this is now being used in many, many different applications. Uh, is being used in orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery. Millions of patients basically today are benefiting from this strategy of using materials alone for tissue regeneration. If it's a larger defect, anything larger than half a centimeter from any edge, you need both the cells and the biomaterials, like we have demonstrated for many of the tissue types that we have shown today. And then we can have many strategies to create solid organs. We can use cell therapy alone. We can use bioprinting. Or we can use the decellarized cell. I'm sorry. Could, could you repeat the question again? Uh, her question was, uh, she doesn't have the sense of smell. And she's wondering if uh, regeneration will be able to uh, get her to smell again. Yes, very, very important problem. Very important problem. Uh, you know, we have worked on nasal cells. There are other investigators working on nasal cells as well. Uh, there are many conditions that uh, prevent the sense of smell, including empty nose syndrome and many other conditions. So we take those very seriously. We know that there are uh, many people that suffer from these conditions. Uh, it's a uh, delicate area. 
Uh, it involves sensation and uh, innervation as well, or nerves. And so the work is still in development, not yet ready for clinical use, but definitely being worked on. Can we 3D print or engineer superior organs or systems to enhance a human's form and function? Uh, again, could that question be repeated, please? Can we print or engineer superior organs or systems to enhance a human's form and function? Can you make them better? Um, let's see, maybe could the host repeat the question, please, from the podium? Or Melanie, thank you. Yes, you know it's very interesting. Uh, actually, we uh, not 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 at this point, and hopefully not in the future. <laughs> uh, uh, but basically, you know, at this point, really, that you know, you're really using the cells that have their own program. So the thing to understand about the, these technologies is that all the cells that we're using, every single cell in your body has all the genetic information to recreate a whole new you. Every cell, every cell in your body has all the genetic information necessary to create a whole new you. And that's how cloning works. That's how Dolly was cloned. They took one cell only from Dolly, the sheep, and they were able to then take that cell and then turn on all that genetic information to create a whole new sheep that was a clone of Dolly's. It's the same thing with your cells. Every cell in your body has all the genetic material information that it needs. So all we're really doing is allowing those cells to do what they are already programmed to do. We cannot really super program them, at, if you will, uh, at this point. Um, doctor, in the case of the human liver, where you remove the cells by washing out, and you say there was a scaffolding left, if you washed all the cells away, what was the scaffolding made, the, the remaining scaffolding made of? Great question. The scaffold is really uh, made up of collagen and elastin, uh, basically, uh, 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 those are the three, ma well, it's made out of three uh, proteins, collagen, elastin, and laminin, but it's mostly over 95% collagen. Collagen is the glue that holds your whole body together. Your whole body is basically made up of, co of that mixture of those three things, which is 95% collagen and cells. So really, uh, it's the glue that holds your whole body together. And the nice thing about that glue is that that glue does not induce rejection. So that collagen can be is basically can be used in any patient. It's the same from patient to patient in terms of the protein, and therefore it does not reject. It cannot be rejected. With this technology, is immortality in the foreseeable future? <laughs> Uh, not at all. Uh, but, no. but you know, uh, the fact is that really it's not about, you know, really the technology is really just to make patients' lives better, to improve the quality of life. Uh, you know, if a patient has end stage failure with an organ, uh, you know, instead of being hooked up to a machine like dialysis, for example, you want to give that patient back their quality of life by providing that functionality that they are missing in that specific organ. So yes, you can prolong life because you can actually, patients who are sick, you can make them have a normal life, but you're not gonna take someone who's normal and make their lives longer. It's basically the technologies are aimed really to cure disease uh, and to make patients better in that manner. Question from the balcony. Liver regeneration goes back to Prometheus and I wonder, what, what's the possibility of the things that you've shared with us today to help neonate and in utero surgery for uh, cardiac defects? Yes, uh, Melanie, could you repeat that for me, please? <laughs> well, Mary, thank you, sorry, thank you.
cardiac, yes. Yes, very interesting. So we are looking at uh, we are looking at using these techniques uh, for um, uh, in utero, where we can actually use these technologies for uh, transplantation of in, uh, of cells in utero. And the concept there, we we have also published in this area, where you know, let's say that a diagnosis is made before birth uh, of a specific condition in utero. Uh, the, the concept there would be can we actually then take a small biopsy uh, of the, uh, uh, just like you would, you know how you do amniocentesis many times, so uh, for diagnostic purposes uh, before birth uh, during pregnancies you can have what's called amniocentesis where they take some of the amniotic fluid from the sur that surrounds the developing baby in the womb or you can take a little piece of the placenta that surrounds both the developing baby and the fluid in the womb, that's called chorionic villus sampling. And you can actually go to, um, just during, while you're doing these diagnostic tests prenatally, before the baby's born in mom, you can actually harvest these tissue sources and we can actually isolate stem cell populations from these tissue sources and by isolating these stem cell populations, we can then drive these cells to become specific cell types with the hope of actually putting those cells back in utero before the baby's born or at the time that the baby's born so we can help that baby uh, regenerate and have a normal tissue uh, over time. And that's really definitely a strategy that we're working on for different tissue types, including some genetic conditions, for example, such as hemophilia, uh, Dr. Parada, who in, is in our group, is actually we're working uh, to get stem cells from the womb and then try to treat hemophilia in that manner, for, for example, just as, a, as an example of how we're trying to bring these technologies to, to treat babies uh, before they're born. All right, uh, my question is about uh, what are the unique challenges when you're developing organs that have to be in tune uh, with your body's hormones or the endocrine system? Uh, Mary, could you repeat that? Thank you, Mary. Glad you're there. Uh. Yeah, so basically uh, that's a part of the advantage, for example, uh, of these uh, constructs like endocrine tissues, for example, uh, to replace, I'll give you an example. One of the things we're working on is, um, let's say that uh, someone uh, lost their uh, ovaries, uh, which make estrogen, and they have to be on daily estrogen, uh, but they are taking daily estrogen with a pill, which is a hormone, uh, that a very important hormone for females. And so uh, the concept there is that if you're taking the hormone with a pill, uh, you really don't have any feedback mechanism. You don't have any feedback from the brain telling you that you need more hormones or less hormones. Um, and so the concept is, for example, why not engineer ovarian tissue that we can put back into the patient and the ovarian tissue that we put back into the patient will be able to uh, modulate the endocrine response, the hormonal response. So for example, if someone had uh, the ovaries taken because of cancer, uh, instead of having to go into the, into the drug, uh, a daily dose of the drug, you can just put in new ovarian tissue there that will actually do that for you and have the feedback loop present uh, for that patient. So that's uh, work that's currently ongoing. So what about the secret of the salamander? What's the secret of the salamander? Yes. Yes. So actually, you know, it's, it's being studied extensively. So part of the secret of the salamander is just basically its size. So, um, you know, things can regenerate over small distances. And in fact, uh, we as humans, we are constantly regenerating. So there's nothing really magical about the salamander. It just has to do with its, uh, its size. We as humans are also regenerating all the time. You may not know this, but uh, your your skin is turning over and regenerating every every 14 days. So every 14 days, all the surface of your skin is new. Every seven days, the whole entire lining of your intestine has turned over. 
Every 10 years, your whole bone structure has turned over. Every 20 years, your brain has turned over, which explains some of the behavior of our teenagers. Uh, but basically, we are in fact constantly regenerating. And so uh, uh, our bodies regenerate. The challenge is that we really do not regenerate very well at the time of injury. And that really has to do with the body's uh, own programming. We are programmed to really close ourselves off from the outside environment to protect us from infection. Infection still remains the number one cause of death even today. Number one cause of death in the medical system today is infection. So our bodies are highly protective. Uh, so when we get injured, uh, the number one thing that happens in our body is we have the potential to regenerate over small distances. But if it's a large distance, scar will uh, set in instead of the normal tissue. So we form scar at the expense of regeneration to protect us from infection. That's supposed to salamander who lives in the swamp and lives among bacteria and viruses all the time. We do not have the ability to do that. So, for example, uh, most of you in the audience have cut yourself shaving, right? Uh, if you cut yourself shaving, you know, it bleeds a lot, but the next day, there's no scar. No scar at all. You cannot see the scars from your, shape, from, uh, your shaving cuts for the most part. But as a surgeon, I go to the operating room and I make an incision with a, a scalpel that is basically the same size as your shaving blade. But 100% of the time, I get a scar. Every time I make an incision, I'm creating a scar. What's the difference? The difference is the size of the injury that was created. With a shaving blade, you basically are able to, you cut yourself, but it's superficial and the cells in your body are able to regenerate right away and there's no scar. But if the defect is larger, your body, the cells can still regenerate, but the defect is too large for the cells to regenerate over a small dis over a larger distance, so the scar will set in. And that's the problem that we have in humans is really at the time of injury, scar forms at the expense of regeneration to protect us from infection. Um, as I understood what you said, um, there's no uh, 3D printed organs that have yet been implanted in anybody. Um, when are we going to see that and uh, which organ is it going to be? How long out is it? Yes, yeah, so basically we have now implanted flat tubular and hollow non-tubular uh, organs in patients. But these were all created by hand. We have also implanted cells in solid organs, uh, uh, also created by hand. The question, the, the, are, we are now using all the technology that we have developed over the last 12 years to actually bioprint these organs and then put those into patients. So now we're going back uh, to those trials and we're gonna then be doing all these tissues, but now we're gonna put them back into patients by using the printing technology which is really just a, a better manufacturing tool for us at this point. And that's, you know, currently in development and uh, uh, going forward uh, as we speak. Um, yes, uh, coming back to uh, uh, the question of the salamander and the size of the, size of the wound, um, uh, is the reason that you only get, I think you said a half a centimeter to a centimeter before it can no longer regenerate is because, uh, uh, because there's not support underneath it, so to speak. Uh, what, why can't it go further? And then that's kind of my, my first question. Uh, and, and then the second is, is anybody working on that to get cells to go further than a centimeter or whatever it, the amount was? You know, rather, rather than make patches and so forth, you know, to put it uh, not so delicately, that, sh that the, the kind of technology you've been talking about, but actually have something in place which is allows them, the cells themselves to go across the whole wound. Is that even conceivable or possible? Or? Uh, Mary, could you help? <laughs> Uh, 
could I just maybe try? Well, he can't he hear it. I guess. Yeah. What, uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, is one is the reason that cells can only go about a centimeter, you know, regeneration before they can't go any farther, is because there's not support underneath, like in all this 3D printing that, that we've been talking about. That's one and two. Let me do one. Okay. <laughs> The second one is, are they working on a, any development to make that happen? Oh, I, I didn't hear Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, uh, the interesting thing is that the, um, the salamander regenerates through a, uh, a different system that allows the cells to just keep going and across small distances. In humans, uh, we basically regenerate uh, only over very tiny distances unless we have the support. And we can only lengthen the support to half a centimeter from any edge if we use an additional support with a scaffold. So that is why when you cut yourself shaving, uh, you have no scar, but if I make an incision uh, in surgery, you do have a scar, but that's less than half a centimeter, but you still formed a scar. The way to do that is to really put a scaffold in there to avoid the scar over, over distances. And you basically are able to reduce the scar by putting in a scaffold and a support. And in humans, that support is lengthened up to half a centimeter from any edge. In the salamander, there are small distances and they're flat so that you can actually travel uh, uh, through the distances, but, it has not, but the salamander itself is providing the support because it's able to do so without any fear of infection. And that's really the difference.